you know, I, I would argue against the concept that the painted that broadly, that the code itself decimated what was going on creatively at the beginning. The whole crusade against comics in the 1950s had so many dimensions, and the code was, depending on how you want to look at it, either a band-aid or the publishers would have argued at the time, certainly a salvation, to have some form of a comics industry survive the work that was going on. The forces overall that were working on comics at that time were enormously anti-creative. Um, the business model for comics was not one that had a great deal of respect for creativity going into the witch hunt period. And the boundaries of what was quote unquote permissible became narrowed tremendously because of the witch hunt. The code literally codified many of those limitations and became kind of a last straw that helped drive particularly EC Comics, which was one of, one of the most creative companies of that period, out of the comic book business. But you got to be a little careful separating the symptom from the cause in the whole thing. Um, to understand what was going on in the period, you have to understand that you had a general perception in society that comics were for children, were for perhaps, on average, not the brightest of children, the most easily influenced children, um, and that the distribution of comics was really controlled as a function by a handful of companies that were distributors of all variety of magazines, including comics. And they had very little interest in what was going into the publications that they were distributing. All they wanted was not to have problems. Um, if they couldn't sell pornography, they wouldn't sell pornography that week, or they would sell what was deemed not to be pornography that week. That's largely how the comic book industry came into existence in the first place. Most of the original publishers kind of crawled up from the borderlines of pornography in the 1930s when it got too tough to do porn in New York City in the theater all of the um, And they kind of jumped from one thing to another. And when comics became problematic, they were quite prepared to stop distributing comics at all. The code was a solution that a number of the comic publishers put together to who, whose publications didn't change very much because of the code. Their own behavioral standards and styles for the time were pretty damn tame. Their vision of themselves was we do clean, simple things for kids. Little things change, one publisher or another. We won't, DC wouldn't do werewolves anymore because werewolves was going to go on the, the band list. But if you picked up randomly 20 DC comics from three months before the comics code and 20 from after, you wouldn't have seen a phenomenal change. The big change was for the publishers who were either being pushed out because of the same forces that as you published things like Crime Does Not Pay or the EC line um, that were being forced to make extremely radical changes. In many cases, destroying some creativity that was going on as well as destroying some arguably tasteless material. And often creativity involves touching on the tasteless. That's a, a natural process. Um, by the 60s and 70s, the code had a much less important function in the business because the business had basically been reduced to the standard of doing safe stuff. And everyone was sort of set to do that. Uh, and the code simply became, for the publishers, an easy methodology to tell their distributors and their retailers who knew very little about the product, this one's okay to hand to a child. And it stayed on serving some version of that process 
as long as the newsstand business was alive, and then sort of vestigially for another decade or so beyond the end of the newsstand being a significant business for a variety of different reasons that serve the purpose of one set of publishers or another. Gentlemen, you were engaged, many of you were engaged in um, <coughs> early comic book fandom, participating in, um, in the fanzines uh, that were commenting on the field in the period where the code became active. What was the perception amongst um, fandom of the code, and how was the, what was the, how did that contrast with what Paul was discussing about how publishers saw um, the comics code as a marketing tool? How did you see it when it, when it affected the content? Um, I remember reading uh, some of the fanzines, uh, and Rightly or wrongly, uh, probably rightly, uh, they attacked the entire Frederick Wortham approach. Uh, it, it was definitely a, a viewed as 100% censorship uh, without any an acceptance that maybe the books wouldn't have been published at all after that, uh, but on a creative basis and through the fact that some of the most prized uh, companies in their minds uh, had to die. Uh, I'm a huge fan of both the EC stuff and the Charles Byron material. I, I thought he was a brilliant writer. So obviously I agree with that concept. But fandom saw things purely as they should. They were buying comic books, and suddenly the type of comic book, if they were old enough, uh, that they enjoyed could no longer be published. Now, I became fans of both of the things I mentioned, you see in Charles Byro books, the Prun Does Not Pay, and things like that, only as an adult. When I was a teenager, uh, older, I never saw them as a kid. I never saw an EC comic, which probably means my eyes glazed over them because I was not interested in that subject matter. I went directly to the superhero stuff. And I think a lot of kids actually did go to the superhero stuff, or Archie or Casper or whatever else, whereas the older readers uh, went to the uh, ECs and the other material, and nobody differentiated older and younger readers. I think we self-censor ourselves. Uh, I'm sorry, I, uh, sense that makes no sense. Late in the day. Yeah, late in the day. Uh, <laughs> we censored ourselves in the sense that we just would not buy something that was not of interest to us. And back in the 50s, uh, when I was buying comics, I had no interest in that material. Once I was old enough, I definitely was. But once I was old enough, that material wouldn't have had any uh, wouldn't have bothered me in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. So I think people do sort out that sort of stuff on their own. Now, Sergio, you have a long association uh, professionally with William Gaines, who was um, the publisher of EC Comics and um, you know, famously took the stand in the Kefauver hearings and, um, and had to change his business afterwards. Um, can you tell me a bit about your, comp your, your work with him and his attitudes towards, um, towards the censorship and the code as it, uh, as it persisted through his life? <laughs> Bill Gaines was a very uh, exceptional man. Uh, he likes things his way. He wouldn't go half the So when something bothered him, he wouldn't fight for it. He just, the heck it. They don't want this, they can have it. I don't do that anymore, I'll do a magazine now. He was not going to I argue with anybody. He wanted to do the things his way. We have a big problem in this country that we abuse what is not regulated because a lot of people want to make more money or they want to make more of a name. So if you don't re regulate alcohol, everybody will be drunk. And if you don't regulate comics, everybody will be putting I'm sorry I cannot say the words because 
I'm already it's answered right here. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that I have to watch my mouth. But if they were allowed, everybody will do it because they know that people just for the because they were for they will buy it just because it has all these very words. So yeah, sure that's the curse. So it's it's necessary sometimes to have controls. Bill Gates didn't care for control. He didn't care for controlling his business. He didn't care in control with, with his personal life. There used to be a restaurant down below the offices of Matt. He went to have dinner, and they didn't allow him to go without a tie. So he called every executive that he knew from every business, have them there go to the restaurant without a tie, and tell them, I'm not entering your restaurant because I don't have a tie. And every day, 20 people went to the restaurant and they didn't enter, the groups in 20s and big executives, <laughs> and says, we, we were have a reservation for 25 people, but we're not entering because we don't have a tie. And Bill Gates would keep calling all these people to go there, and of course the restaurant changed the rules. And they sent somebody upstairs, Mr. Gates, you can come anywhere you want to address. <laughs> so he would do things like that because he was a very different person. So when the code came into, he just got rid of everything. So that's it. I don't want to have any trolls. I'm going to make it a magazine. So he had my magazine, became a magazine, and he didn't do any comics anymore. I, did, I wasn't familiar with all the work that he had done before in the comics because many of them didn't arrive to Mexico. I grew up in Mexico. And in Mexico, many of the comics that arrived were kind of self-centered, but self, uh, self-censured, censored, censored, censored. Not by the government, not by the people, but by the church, which is a very influence in, in Mexico, you know. So if the church said that, you cannot read that, nobody will read it. So many of the comics were totally antiseptic, all of them. So the ones I grew up with very, very innocent. So I, I was very familiar with the life that Bill Gates had. When I arrived to the States and I discovered it, I spent every night with my dad just laying down on Bill Gates' sofa reading all these comics and <laughs> learning English and discovered what an amazing group of artists these people were. And after you read them all at once, they had a the chance to read them once a month. So they didn't know how repetitious the stories were. They didn't read them all at once, and I said, oh my god, it wasn't this long time. So I saw that two, two months before. <laughs> but I, I, I realized that here they needed a code, not only for survival, but also for self-control. Uh, it affected Europe a lot. It, it, it affected very much. Uh, I don't know if this is part of the, the code, but in Europe, all the, in, let's say, for example, France, they were very distinctive, the magazines done for children, like Elot, and uh, uh, they were made ex exclusively for children. There were nothing uh, that you say, well, this, this my family cannot read, even though you can drink wine at age 11, which is normal, but you cannot read certain things. Many of the artists, when they discovered that the Americans have gotten very free with the underground, decided that it was time for freedom. So they start publishing in, in Pilot, many of the magazines, a more adventures. They start with nudity and with other words and, and uh, more, more serious, more adult stuff. So the editors try to censor them and say, no, this is for children, even though they didn't have a code. The editors themselves have control of what it was. So all the cartoonists decide to form their own magazines. Moebius, uh, Claire Betesche, uh, uh, all, all the guys, they open magazines like Le Co de Savan, Fruit Glacial, Metal Urlan, Circus Circus, who was a total division of what it was the children's magazine. And they became adult magazines, and of course, the industry died. All the other magazines have to die because kids really never thought themselves as kids. They don't like magazines that pander to them, that they are patronizing a, a young person. 
they think themselves as an adult, so they went for the adult magazines, and not other magazines, clubs. And many of the people who did the children's magazine have to survive doing books, self-publishing, and that's it, the magazines that. So censorship influences society very, very strongly. Here, in reality, I don't think anybody really paid that much attention to the code, except the sales part of the industry, who wants to try to have the comics on the stands. Because I'm, I don't even know, if you ask a, a parent about the, the code, they will know what you're talking about. And uh, here the division is very, very marked when you go from a regular code comic, let's say code either do, that doesn't exist, to the adult line. It's very marked. It seems like the young writers, they enjoy putting a, a curse word every two panels <laughs> just for the fun of it. I don't know. They, they have a need for it, which I don't. But they do so. That's what, I don't know if, I, I found censorship of any kind very offensive because I believe that you have to teach your kids at home. Home is a place where you educate your children by example and by telling them that there is a penis and there's a vagina and there's, and there's homosexuals and, and there's, there's priests. And it's all kinds of <laughs> Whatever you say, it has to be said at home. You know, it's not the job of the editors or the publishers, it's the job of the parents. And we should realize that and says, it's your duty. But because an angry parent who buys at Kmart decides to stop buying a magazine, that magazine goes under because sometimes they sell. 30% of the run. And this is just because one father says, there was a tit over there. And my son kind of see tits. I'm going to pick up on that, because you know, everybody's laughing because, because Sergio is incredibly witty in how he presents anything. Um, but it's absolutely true. And there were two or three occasions in particularly the 1990s when comics were beginning to get some traction as being a popular public reading material again. When Walmart or Toys R Us would start taking in comics and you know, everyone at the convention, I think, has agreed on some basic emotional level, more people should read comics. We like comics, they should be available to more people, how come we can't get more people involved? Well, one of the ways to do that is to have it available more places or more places where people go. So publishers, writers, artists, cartoonists were always so excited to be in places like Walmart. And we didn't necessarily want to go there and shop, but, <laughs> but we wanted our work there. And I literally remember one occasion with Walmart where a grandmother wrote to the chairman of Walmart, having picked up an issue of, I believe it was Spawn, um, <laughs> that had been sold in the store in some multi-pack bag with two otherwise harmless looking comics so she couldn't even judge the book by its cover. You know, you were buying three in a plastic bag and the front one was a lovely little Spider-Man story and the back one was a sweet little Archie story or something. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, and he threw, out, threw comics out of the chain and just, you know, sent, sent back millions of comic books, mm. and we were out of there for five or six years thereafter. And that happened several times to the industry. Um, we had a very long time in America, I think that's largely over now, when the popular perception of comics was that they were still for children, and that there may, there may be some, somebody may be doing comics for grown-ups, but those aren't really comics, those are graphic novels, where they find some other way to label it so it wasn't their image, but comics should be what I remember as a child. I cannot convey to you strongly enough the honest passion of these incredibly differently minded people. In many cases, from my personal morality and point of view, evilly minded. Um, in some cases, just wrongfully minded. But 
you know, I took the phone calls at my old desk that would include, you have two men kissing in this comic. How can you do this? You know, I cannot show this to my child. How can you publish this? How can you put something like this out? Comics are supposed to be pure and simple. Um, and talking to a parent, in some ways echoing exactly what Sergio said, saying, look, you're a parent, it is your job to make these decisions for your child. I respect your right to do that. But by the way, if you expect not to see evidence that the world contains a wide range of diverse people, people of color, people who are of different sexual orientation, then you shouldn't buy our comics. And by the way, you might have some trouble having you never watched television today, um, or go to a movie. But, but if you want to raise them in a Skinner box and you think you can pull that off, more power to you. That's your decision as a parent, and, and go try and do that and see how that, that works out for you. Three pulls or so. But they're very passionate about it. And for many, many years, when most of the American media were going through some form or another of, they'd call it broadcast standards for television, self-censorship, just outright editorial policy, narrowing to say, you know, we have blinders on. Anything that is outside these blinders doesn't exist. We're not, we wouldn't put a person of color on the cover of this magazine. Well, they have magazines for people of color. They don't have to read this magazine. Um, all of those things, whether you describe them as censorship, self-censorship, racism, sexism, whatever ism you want to attack them as, there are narrowing that limits creativity and that made the world a more difficult place for people. And mercifully, most of those forces have abated very significantly in society. They're not all gone, um, but it's a little better now. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> just taking a, by the way, I apologize for being late. Um, taking a, a, what Paul was saying, um, I think, and also, on what Sergio was saying, I think that that there's a uh, a human nature aspect that anything that's repressed uh, will it's like an old uh, Tex Avery cartoon, you know, it's with the with the, the wolf, you know, the wolf uh, putting the you know the cigarette in his mouth to stop the smoke, you know, stop him and it comes out his ears. I think that anything that's, that is repressed is going to find a way out, which is why I think that. Even though the comics got a lot of, uh, I mean, when Electra Assassin came out, uh, when Frank and I um, uh, did the first issue, I remember a Fort Worth newspaper article on Friday, and this is this is the sort of problem I have with a lot of the media that come out, and you know, the Bill O'Reillys and all of these sort of umptious, you know, uh, conservators and, and conservatives. And the people who look out for the better, you know, the better nature and everything else, uh, how they want things both ways. Um, the cover for issue number one of Electra had a white background, which uh, worked perfectly with the newspaper because they actually had across the double spread, across the the, the fold, uh, that image of Electra from Electra number one, and um, it said it was written by a, a woman named Clara Tuma, who said we must protect our children from this. Now Clara Tuma, uh, the name rang a bell for me years later because she became very well known working for Court TV covering the O.J. Simpson trial. Um, and a lot of the stuff that we got in trouble for, what we were fighting for in terms of comics, and I think comics in general, um, we were saved a lot of trouble because Thankfully, like the Jim Bakers and the Tammy Faye Bakers and the, the, the very, very religious, you know, extremists uh, screwed themselves. They basically got themselves in a lot of hot water. And so, uh, but they're looking, you know, it's like, we want things a certain way, but we're not going to worry about our own, our own self, as long, as long as we don't get caught. Um, now, with, uh, with her... 
being clear to them, saying, we must protect our children from this. We think we can use that as an, ad, you know, an advertisement because we've also realized <laughs> that if you tell somebody they can't have something, they're going to want it all the more. And I think that one of the things that we're finding out as a culture is that um, there's an element of pendulism, you know, pendulum swinging. So that if you, if you uh, have a blockade about something or a, a censorship and you, you re people push against that, and all of a sudden the, the floodgates burst. And the same thing, all the things I think they talk about with um, uh, drinking, with legalizing drugs, uh, especially like marijuana and things like that, as opposed to, you know, uh, hardcore uh, drugs. Um, I think that what they do is that they will sp sort of spill out and be like a tsunami, and then it will ebb and there will be an equilibrium. In a lot of countries where there is uh, legalization for different drugs, if there's things for uh, alcohol, if there's no problem with censorship, and like and censorship also includes things like the uh, National Endowment for the Arts, um, mm -hmm. where people said we don't want our tax money going to, you know, uh, something by Andre Serrano, um, you know, piss Christ or whatever. It's like how dare you? It's like when they, it becomes a larger image and a larger percentage of the people who are arguing about things that um, are really sort of personal decisions. And as, as Paul said, I think it's up to the parent to really be the, the, uh, the person who decides for their children. And when the children get old enough, then they can ch uh, decide for themselves. So I think, um, uh, think, I think things that are being repressed will be pushed out against by people who want to see there be no blockades. And then, and then things will, will even out. I think that we all look for a level of equilibrium. I think that's human nature. Um, and I think that extremism is also human nature. And it, it works even better if they've got something to push against. So I work, uh, I spent a large part of my career on the uh, marketing side of the so-called direct market, the specialty store market, which was a function of um, an age shift in the audience of comics. Uh, that as when I was young, comics were for eight to 12 year olds, and by the time I was creating comics, they were for probably 12 to 16 year olds. And then, pardon me, and, 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 then, and then as we moved into the 70s and 80s, it, we moved into an audience that was somewhere between 18 and 24, and, and had a large, a very, very large segment there. And, and so we went through this, you know, we don't need the code stuff. I mean, I remember working at Marvel, and, and the code was still had a lot of value in distribution terms or getting marbles into entire states. I mean, we couldn't get comics into entire states unless they had code on them. But the direct market had become big enough that it, could, it, it even in those same states, were, were, were able to sustain things and the code was irrelevant. And, and during the 80s, we went through the shift as an industry where, where the, the uh, newsstand distribution system became less and less relevant and that's where the, the code was aimed at that system. We went through a process where, I mean, I remember very purposefully, we would market things as not being code approved. The content was the same, but we would just say it's not code approved, <laughs> and, and, and that, that helped us spike sales quite a bit. Uh, for the reasons that Bill's talking about, is everyone you know, likes to think that you're, you, know, you avoid all the censorship. Well, then as the market progressed, as we certainly moved into the late 80s, early 90s, um, we were now very successful. We're booming as a, as a field. We're going through a, a boom in the field. And, we be, and the market began to worry about the opposite problem, was that they were now only selling to adults, and there weren't any kids coming into the, into the stores. And they wanted to make sure the, the, uh, the the retailers and the distributors wanted to make sure that they weren't alienating their younger readers or those younger readers' parents. And so we wound up 
I mean, I, Paul could remember this little, the details a little bit better, but I remember the the that we came up with the phrase suggested for mature readers or some something like that. And I remember I remember this was this was a you know very controversial item for you know like a six weeks. Uh, but but it stuck. I mean, you know, we are here we're that today. Um, we're in the middle of a, of a comic fan convention that's a, that's a family-friendly convention. We're told here that, you know, be aware that members of your audience may be under 18. We're being asked to watch our language. Um, uh, the people in the, who, are, who are out there on the floor are told what they can and cannot display visually to the public. You know, because there's a concern for, you know, age-appropriate material. This is, I mean, it's normal. So, personally, you know, I mean, when I've been away from the field for a while, when Charles told me the code was gone, I was like, well, okay, but when was it last here? <laughs> well, right, and one of the interesting things that, that occurred was that the moral panic that gave birth to the comics code, um, created a situation where the business facility was, well, okay, let's dump the stuff, as Paul was saying, let's dump the stuff that's given us trouble and, and create uh, material that won't. And Mike, what you're talking about is an era where we had had 30 years of perception that, you know, comics are kids' stuff, and it created the need for a comic book legal defense fund where specialty stores were having, were, were finding themselves under threat from the law and finding themselves arrested and finding themselves being booked and fingerprinted um, you know, because of the material. But what's interesting to me is uh, I can see all the different sides and all the different problems because I've worked, you know, at DC Marvel and at Disney. <laughs> and that they're very, very different feelings. But even there within the code itself, and I'm not a big fan of the code, but I understood the business reasons it existed. When I was doing a book called Tomb of Dracula for Marvel, I spoke with Linda Dove, and she was the administrator of the, of the code at that particular time, and we fought every single month over something in the book, literally every single month, to the point where I started putting things in solely to have them cut back to where I actually wanted them. But we were getting away with an awful lot of stuff, and I asked Dove, and at one point, why didn't you censor this as opposed to this? And he said, you're doing a book called Tomb of Dracula that's drawn in an illustrative style. It tells the person up front what the age group is for, what, who it's meant for. So even they, somewhere, were starting to understand context. Somebody walking in a convention like this, if they're bringing their family, should not suddenly be surprised by something they were not expecting. When I was at Disney, I was the editor of Disney Adventures magazine, and for the 60th anniversary of Mickey Mouse, I decided to reprint, reprint the very first eight weeks of the Mickey Mouse comic strip, the only material ever drawn, uh, written by Walt Disney himself, and drawn by other works who created the mouse, the two of them. Um, I removed, I censored the stuff with the black natives in Africa because they were completely offensive. They were drawn in the 30s style, and it was awful. But I was able to segue from one sequence where Mickey is going into the jungle to uh, a little fight with a rhinoceros and stuff like this, and it, you wouldn't have even noticed the missing section. And during the course of the story, remember, this appeared in newspapers when newspapers had millions of people reading them. Um, Mickey fires one of those cartoon guns at a rhinoceros, it misses. He has little cartoon cur symbols over his head, and it goes on. Now, this came out in 1930 some two, I think it was. Uh, and I'm reprinting it for the 60th anniversary. We got so much hate mail. Hmm and so many uh, threats of cancellation of subscriptions because we had Mickey Mouse firing the gun and having curse symbols over its head. After it had appeared 60 years before in the newspapers, taste had changed by that point, and people, that was the concern of the time. Uh, and I think that's something that's important. And, you know, when dealing with a lot of this stuff, I had to write letters to every single person 
I never apologized for the content, but I did say the reason we did this was this, and I'm sorry that it was offending you, but we had no idea because it had been published in newspapers. And we deeply apologize, and it will not happen again. And I made sure Mickey never fired a gun. I never uh, did that. But it was out of context for what people expected when they saw a Mickey Mouse comic. Let, let, let me connect this a different way, because I think we've got a couple of threads rolling here that I think everyone on the the dais is very conscious of, but you may you may not you may not see as obviously, or you may be interested to hear. The Legal Defense Fund is driven by a First Amendment passion, which I think everyone on the dais shares. There's a difference between a First Amendment passion and a creative freedom passion. They run together in many places, but they're not exactly synonymous. You're faced in all of these situations with a number of forces that work against the freedom of expression. Some of them are editorial decisions. Marv was talking through a very sincere and honest weighing he had to go through as an editor of what he could bring forward. And you come to a different conclusion every time you do that. When we went to archivally reprint Will Eisner's The Spirit, you look at Ebony. And Will wouldn't have done Ebony the same way ten years later. He certainly wasn't looking back on Ebony with great pride as this was one of the great moments I had of creative genius. But this was an archival project being sold for 50 bucks a book that obviously was a historical thing. And you could reasonably put in it a historical note that sort of pointed, hey, this is from 19, 1940. Society was different. Society's views were different in some, some bad ways. And we haven't whitewashed it, we should pardon the phrase very different situation than Mars, where the comic was going to go in the hands of little children, and parents would reasonably, reasonably expect something labeled Disney Adventures that was being bought for a dollar and a quarter or something at a checkout counter in a supermarket um, to be a perfectly safe and harmless product. The Legal Defense Fund is there so that we can protect the channels of sale, the channels of distribution, where anything that is created by people who have the creative desire to do it and can manage to get it published, whether it's self-published, whether it's published by a company, that can reach an audience that is sold or distributed by someone knowledgeable, whether that's a comic shop, a library, can have access to the tools to defend their right to choose to distribute something. That's very important in society. That's what the First Amendment is about. It's a great tool for creative freedom and creative expression. It's not a perfect tool. It does not defend creators against editors. It didn't defend uh, Erwitz against Marr. Um, no, not that he was still alive, I think, at that point, or necessarily would have cared. Uh, it doesn't defend the next writer who's doing a story for Marvel or DC or some small press, or an independent creator who's just saying, you know, I, I don't know if I can get any distribution for this if, if, I, if I put the word fuck in it. Sorry. No one under 18 here. Excellent. Um, <laughs> These things fit together, but they're not, they're, not the, they're not the same thing. And there's a great deal of sincerity in all parts of this process. Even Alain Darwin, who was really the last administrator of the code who really fought in a very restricted way against some of the changes that were going on in the business. And we had many arguments, and he rejected at least one story I wrote early on in my career. Um, was sincerely trying to do what he thought was right. Because there's, there's the absolutes of these things are very difficult. The Legal Defense Fund has the advantage that it's able to fight for an absolute. 
The First Amendment is a very absolute principle, and that's, it's great to be able to sign on to that. Um, the issue of where does, where does censorship and editorial judgment and writers and artists' own creative judgment of what they're trying to do overlap in boundaries is far from absolute and much more challenging to work your way through. What was wrong with the 50s that held on for so long is with guys like Wortham, they created a cloud that affected not just that the code came into place, not just that editorial standards for the different companies changed, not just that the creators themselves were more cautious, either in the way that Bill was to say, if I can't do what I need to do here, if they're going to take the damn drop of sweat off the head of a black man because I can't do a story where a black man shows sweat, um, I'm, I'm out of here, man. I'm not doing it. It drove creativity out of the field because it drove talented people from trying to do comics in all of those circumstances. Also, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the one thing is very important is that many artists, many writers, through the years, through centuries, they were unaware of insults. When they drew black people, they make them big leaps and they laugh. They were offending. With time, many of the black people rebelled about all these conditions. And they made an effort and groups and fights. And many people got killed defending their rights. In the moment that we change those faces right now, and we deny that those things existed, like in the university, they trying to take the word nigger out of Tom Sawyer. In the moment you deny that, you deny all the efforts. Yeah, there were, excuse me, just one thing, what they done, what they did was, they actually changed his name to Slave, you know, yeah. which is like, yeah. <laughs> it's but just. You are, you are negating everything that has been fought so people didn't draw people with big lips. That was a big fight. And that was Twain's entire comic reason he, he named it that. You're right. Absolutely. I, I, pardon so me for I, I think that yeah. censorship should be very careful to not offend more trying to defend something that is should be known that it was done like that. And as much as we love Will Eisner, he made an enormous mistake doing that. You know, and it was offensive. Now he knows it, and he, well. <laughs> but what he did was wrong. Because he didn't know about it. There's a... Oh, I don't think he did it on purpose. He, he was with a current, you know. But we cannot deny it. There's a wonderful term that doesn't get used much in discussion anymore. Uh, out of, I guess it was it out of uh, British literary history called Baudelaireizing, mm -hmm. which is the form of the form of censorship where you just it, it's exactly the Tom Sawyer story. You you're just you're just going to go in and clean up the naughty bits. How do you call that? Baudelaireizing. B-O-W-B-E-A-W-W-B-E-A-W-B-E-A-W-B-E-A-W-B-E-A-W-B-E-A-W-B-E-A-W-B-E-A-W-B-E-A-W-B-E-A-W-B-E-A-W-B-E-
this is a constant battle in all creative fields. And yeah, this one part of the battle is between the individual creative person and the publishing company. You know, the editorial judgment. Should you change this? Should you not change this? I want to tell my story this way. Another part is within the companies themselves, what they should do. Another part is in commerce. It all interrelates, and it's all about these issues that, as a society, the more we allow our society to be closed-minded, the more we allow our society to ignore groups of people or stereotype groups of people, the, the soul gets taken out of us collectively, and that's reflected in the creative work. The more the expression is allowed to be free, the more soul there will be in all of it. It ain't ever going to be perfect. It ain't ever going to be without tension. And you're going to always see imperfect solutions like the MPAA ratings, the video game ratings, the rating systems that comic book publishers have used, the suggested for maturities. They all are imperfect. But but life's imperfect. Um, and the more open and honest society gets, the more all of this will naturally fall away. I also think that there's a, uh, even a, a larger situation in terms of how I perceive it. It's, it's that um, even if there are things that the First Amendment allows, I think, uh, and I, I talk about like in terms of TV and film and other things, it doesn't necessarily, in my uh, estimation, it doesn't really necessarily mean that it should be done. Uh, either. Um, if you look at a lot of stuff that, that's passing for, for entertainment now, and, and again, I, maybe it's commerce that's driving it, but um, you know, there's, a, there's a sort of, amongst many of the peers that I, that I, I talk to, is that there's, a, there's a generalization of, of dubbing down of, of discourse in, term, and in terms of entertainment. You know, people talk about the Jersey Shore, they talk about different TV shows, they talk about um, entertainment that is kind of demeaning and diminishing the social discourse and the level of intelligent discourse. Um, and in, in the same way, it's like some people are looking at comics as sort of this elitist kind of uh, thing. I remember years ago thinking, uh, reading different reviews where they would talk about um, a film having like idiotic comic book style dialogue. And I remember thinking it would be great to read something about comics where they referred to the dialogue being insipid movie style dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> and it came to pass. It actually happened. And, um, you know, and it went, so things are, are sort of coming now to a point where comics are actually, with, with so many wonderful writers and artists, and, uh, and with the pushing and the social acceptance and the, uh, the artistic accept uh, acceptance. Um, comics are seen in a, in a much more literate capacity, and it's a shame that in some ways when you think of the word literate, it has a negative connotation because it, it sort of becomes this, this elitist stuff, you know, that, that becomes a negative, um, uh, where somehow uh, we don't want no fancy book learning, you know, it's like, and it, it, so it, to me, it's it's like there's so many we're we're we're, we're beyond bifurcated as as a culture. We are like forget three faces of Eve. I mean, we are you know we're we're splintered, absolutely splintered. So that um, uh, you know you've got the the Tea Party versus the, the Libertarians versus the Conservatives versus it and. We're, we're all sort of fighting for certain parts of the pie. And, and in a way, some people, maybe we find that there are alliances and allegiances that are made in terms of, of the enemy of the enemy is our friend or whatever. But, um, but I, I think that, that you know, we need to learn and understand things like about our culture and about what will advance perhaps the level of inter intercourse, and I mean, you know, I'm not talking about sex, I'm talking about intercourse, in terms of how we, we, we our discussion, so that we can um, we can rise to a certain level as opposed to 
falling to a circle. Well, let me make a quick point and do a commercial before we finish, because Charles may be too dignified to do it since he's hosting it. The evidence of how far we've come as a society in the perception and the cultural view of comics is most powerfully embodied by an exhibition that a couple of us were just at the opening of in New York a week ago, of Robert Crumb's work celebrating the success of his Genesis book. Hmm. If there was a book publisher in the mass market 30 years ago who had, had made the decision to take underground cartoonist Robert Crumb, <laughs> most famous for his drawings of genitalia and sexuality, and had him do a book of the Bible, first of all, they would have come with white coats and taken the man out of the office. <laughs> then the stockholders would have come and shut down the company. And then the bookstore chains, and other than the handful of most aggressively independent cultural bookstores, maybe City Lights here in San Francisco, would have turned around and said, we cannot carry this book. Put it in a, put it in a brown wrapper, Yes, it's a lovely, faithful treatment of the Bible, except for the fact that they're naked, and you can see that they're naked. But this man's a smut peddler. It, this is, you can't allow him to touch the Bible. And yet this was one of America's best-selling graphic novels from a major book publisher last year. That's evidence that the cultural freedom has advanced phenomenally in a very short period of time. And here, the Society of Illustrators, which is... I think fair to say a relatively conservative cre creative group in New York is exhibiting not just the Genesis work, but every little raunchy bit that Crumb did for all his underground work on, on two floors of their gallery along mm. with it, celebrating this. I think it was a Pontius Pilate doing keep on trucking, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. All of, but this is in the same country that where someone went to jail for his comic book collection last year. Um, because the manga he owned, in, whether he read them or not, included books that could be very, very extremely defined as child pornography under a great stretch of the law. We still need fire trucks. There are still fires being set. We don't know when the next fire will be set aimed at us. It's much better. It ain't perfect. And the really, really point. What, I was going to say, what do you foresee? I mean, a part of the grassroots, I'm curious if like, you want to just expand on that. Do you, do you foresee what, um, for certain, not that we want to give our enemies like, like an avenue? You just, or, you, just ne you never know. I mean, we know, we know there are people who are desperately afraid of create these creative ideas. We know that there are people who think the culture and who sincerely believe, I'm not even talking about people who are doing this purely for political advantage. There are people who sincerely sit there and say, the world would be a better place if all reading material had no sexuality in it, had no violence in it. Amen. Um, <laughs> Sergio could draw it all. He's fast. <laughs> and pure enough of heart. Most of um, but they... They're out there. They're willing to set fires. Um, and the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund represents for the medium that we care about, the firehouse. And to sit there and say, well, the Crumb Book, all this good stuff, close the firehouse. We're never going to have a fire again. Mm -hmm. Is nuts. The code's gone. We're never going to need a firehouse. Okay. People are setting fewer fires. That's a really good thing. Maybe we're going into a time where there will never be a fire again. I don't see that happening in, in my lifetime, but may, maybe we get to live to that point. We aren't there yet. And even when we are, it doesn't mean there ever can be a fire again. And I exhort you all, Put your nickel in the drawer, buy your membership, whatever it is you can contribute to it. If you love comics, 
kick in the five bucks or whatever the loose change is in your pocket towards keeping gas in the fire truck because we don't know when we'll need it. And when you need it, it's too goddamn late to buy gas. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we're getting the uh, two minute signs. So we have time for maybe two, three questions. Hi, I, I want to ask Chris a quick question on practices. Um, I, I'm looking at the, um, the 1971 um, revision here of the code because I wanted to get the language right. The part that says, all lurid, unsavory, gruesome illustrations shall be eliminated. Uh, I was wondering, based on you all's experience, um, uh, experiences, how this related or whether this affected the depiction of people with disabilities or deformities. Uh, a very specific example, I'm, I'm writing something on Matt Murdock, and it's been, from what I've researched, uh, there apparently was a policy at Marvel to not show him without his dark glasses on, because that would have been offensive. Not that, that I'm aware of, and I wrote that devil. <laughs> uh, so, no, and in Dracula, we had somebody with, uh, in a wheelchair full time. But specifically uh, about showing his eyes. Yeah, no, uh, if there was, I, I was there for eight years, and as I say, I wrote the book, and uh, I never heard that. You, there, there, there was a letter that, that, that was written in the sixties, and the reply, the letter was printed about this issue, the reply was that it would be offensive to show his eyes. But I drew Marty Feldman many ways, no one would tell me anything. We have a letter column main, uh, it could have been an assistant, it could have been Stan. Uh, but it wasn't passed along to anybody else. Okay. It is 6 o'clock, so we have to open that panel in. Thank you all for your time today. Thank you. Thank you.